and welcome to Aston Martin's Q Branch. Not the real Q Branch, of course, that's back in Gaydon. We're in the pits at Silverstone, but we do have a smoke machine. Go on, give us a puff. Beautiful stuff. We're here to celebrate the special ops Astons, the weirdest, the rarest, the most expensive, the most extreme cars to ever wear the Aston Martin wings. And here they all are, laid out for your viewing pleasure. Now, join me for a walk around this extraordinary collection of cars. I'm gonna tell you what I know, then we're gonna tell you what they're like to drive. Sound good? Excellent. We'll start here with my mate, Victor. It is a total one-off, based around a refurbished 177 chassis and powered by a 177's 7.3 litre V12, except here it's been retuned by Cosworth to produce 836 horsepower. And get this, all that power is sent to the rear wheels through a six-speed manual gearbox. How brilliant is that? It's got the suspension from a Vulcan, it's got the side pipes from a Vulcan, this carbon fibre bodywork is inspired by the brutish vantage from the 70s and 80s. It's even got the tail lights from the Valkyrie and it's about as subtle as a sledgehammer, but it's making me feel a bit weak at the knees just being next to it. I'll tell you what, I would absolutely love a go in this. Sorry, Jack, too slow. Way, way too slow. Picked up. It's my mate now, and look at what he can do! Amazing noise, drama, feet well, excitement, response, and a manual gearbox! This is all I want from a hypercar. It's just fabulous. It's so aggressive and yet well balanced and Ferocious, absolutely ferocious. But it's got that long wheelbase, so even when it starts to slide, it's not too terrifying. But look at the power of this thing. It's just fabulous. And there's a bit of body roll in it, so it's not trying too hard to be perfectly locked to its line or anything. It just wants to have a bit of fun and show you what it can do. My God, what it can do is amazing. So you can just left foot brake and balance the car and then tuck that nose in tight to the apex and then just come out with a bit of force. And actually, it's got a lot of grip, got a lot of grip, but the brakes are just mighty. <laughs> Do I mind that the, uh, the, you know, the gear changes aren't absolutely instant? Not a bit. And as a combination, this car shouldn't work. Half of it thinks it's a Vulcan, and half of it thinks it's an old 70s Vantage. And yet, it works. It works so well. Damn. Need to hide the keys better from Ollie Marriage. Moving on to something that probably needs no introduction, does it? Because this is the Aston Martin Vulcan, named after the god of fire and volcanoes and other hot things, which is fitting really, because its party piece is shooting foot-long flames out of this side exit exhaust. Hopefully not while I'm here. What is it? Well, it's Aston Martin's interpretation of the most visceral, extreme track toy you could possibly produce. It was actually originally conceived as a track-only 177, a 177R, if you like, but quickly morphed into something more individual and much more extreme. When it was new, it cost 1.8 million quid. They only ever built 24 of these, and it's powered by a seven-litre naturally aspirated V12, producing 820 horsepower. Interestingly, that's not a downsized version of the 7.3 engine you get in the 177. It's actually a bored out version of the six litre V12 from the GT3 Vantage racer at the time. Usefully, Aston Martin gives you three levels of power to play with. So you can 
ease yourself in. 550 horsepower, 675 horsepower, and then the full 820 horsepower, which actually isn't that much when you compare it to other track-only hypercars like the FXXK and the McLaren P1 GTR. But the Vulcan isn't about just the plain numbers. It's the way that it delivers them. Here's Ollie to explain. You forget. That's the problem. You just forget. It's been five years since the Vulcan came out and other things have come along. I've driven the Brabham BT62 and the McLaren Senna GTR. And the temptation is to think because they're newer, they're better, they're more exciting, they're more visceral. Getting back in this thing again, I'd forgotten. <laughs> I've forgotten just how intense it is. It's just such a big beast to manage. But even around here, I mean, it's, it's surprisingly friendly because of that long wheelbase. Even though you can't attack the braking in the same way you can in some of the, in some of the others. Especially not today, because we're on, we're on the Michelin Sport Cup 2s not the full slips. It's just how quickly it deals with everything. So the suspension has dealt with any issues before you've even realised they're happening. And no matter how hard you hit the brakes, you don't seem to trouble it at all. It's astonishing. And this one has had the AMR upgrades. So it's got the extra dive blades at the front and the two-storey rear wing. So even more downforce, as if it needed it. And if you compare it to the Victor, it's very different. The Victor has that bit of movement and control in it. And this is just much firmer and more rigid. And that engine is just so visceral. No track going hypercar should be this playful and friendly. Oh my god. I'm not going back in. Sorry Jack. This one stays out with me for a while. Now excuse me if I get a little bit gushy over this one because when I was younger, way back before I had any hope of ever driving this car, this was definitely in my top three fantasy garage. The original brief with this was to create something that was closer to art than an automobile. And it's a damn good go, isn't it? It's got those classic Aston proportions, long bonnet, cab back stance, and everything's just exaggerated. It's blown out of proportion. It's cartoonish. It looks fantastic. And you get little glimpses of what's underneath. So if you come around the back here, you can see the inboard pushrod suspension. It's just filthy gorgeous. It belongs in a glass cabinet, not a car. And the engine too is a thing of beauty. Now underneath the 177 has a carbon chassis. It's wrapped in aluminium panels and it cost, when it was new, a mind melting 1.2 million pounds. It was revealed 12 years ago, way back in 2009, but it wasn't until 2014 that Top Gear magazine got our hands on one. That's because Aston Martin put a blanket ban on any car journalist anywhere in the world getting behind the wheel. So we just flew to Dubai and borrowed one off a dealer. One nil. Now, I remember reading that story, thinking it was impossibly exotic, pouring over the details and then learning that it had a bit of a dud gearbox and being heavily disappointed. But look, it was a long time ago, a lot of water under the bridge. I think it's time I found out for myself. Okay, so the engine in this is a 7.3 litre naturally aspirated V12 producing 750 horsepower once Cosworth have their way with it. And the numbers still have the power to shock today. Nord 62, 3.6 seconds, top speed 220 miles an hour. So let's just give it a little squirt down this straight, shall we? Now you've got 
active bypass valves that open beyond 4,000 RPM and the noise, the noise just goes into the stratosphere with this heart piercing scream. It's absolutely glorious. And here's the big surprise that I wasn't expecting. You look at this car and you think it's just gonna be a big, heavy, brutal GT, but actually, nah, none of it. It feels super stiff in that carbon chassis. It feels light on its feet. The steering is super light and precise. It's an accurate machine. It doesn't feel out of its depth on track. It's more up for it than I thought it would be. And now we must talk about the gearbox. Back in 2014, Tom Ford, and I quote, called it rubbish. And do you know what? It's actually, yeah, yeah, he was right. It's absolutely rubbish. It's super slow. It doesn't suit the car, the rest of the package at all. It slurs on upshifts. You nod your head forward like that. It's a bit criminal, really, that they put such a medieval gearbox in a car that's in so many other ways on the bleeding edge of technology. Now, Aston say they got their reasons for that, that a twin clutch gearbox was too heavy and too expensive and would take too long to engineer into the package, but I'm not buying it. They should have just waited. But look, this car is full of drama. It's a piece of art. It's everything that an Aston Martin should be. It's flawed, but I love it. Never meet your heroes, eh? Rubbish. No, nope, you haven't slipped off into some sort of dream world. This really is an Aston Martin Signet with a V8 engine from the last gen Vantage S. The Signet, you may recall, was Aston Martin's first and only foray into the city car market where they inexplicably took a Toyota IQ, swapped the badges around, gave it a new grille, smothered it in leather and other expensive materials. Perhaps this one off is Aston trying to save face. Basically what you got here is the front and rear subframes from Avantage S bolted onto the central Signet chassis, hence the comedy wheel arches. And up front, you've got a 4.7 litre V8 mounted so low and far behind the front axle that I can't believe it doesn't protrude into the cabin, but it doesn't. Clearly, this car hasn't gone through the same rigorous development process of other mainstream Aston Martins, but I don't care. The world is an infinitely better place than it exists. Let's take it for a spin. Okay, so the first thing you notice in here is, as long as you're looking forwards, it's quite a lot like driving Avantage, apart from the fact that there's carbon fiber literally everywhere. So you've got dials from the old Vantage, you've got switch gear from the old Vantage, and then if you happen to look over your left shoulder, you realize you can basically lean back and touch the rear windscreen. It's absolutely bizarre how short this car is. And then we get to the noise. Now, the Vantage S was already a very nice sounding car, but this thing sounds on another level. You're just so much closer to the action. There's so much less sound deadening. It's also got naughtier pipes on this car. Woohoo, listen to that. Oh, it's a little rascal. And then we get to the way this thing handles. So, if you step on the throttle, <laughs> the nose just rises up and points towards the sky. And then if you stomp on the brakes, it dives right down and the nose basically tries to bury itself into the tarmac. Now, because of its short wheelbase, because of the fact that this car is basically just a square, the wheelbase is pretty much the same length as the track width, you think it's gonna be really, really twitchy. And it's not actually, it's more stable, there's more grip than you think. It's busy though, look at this, it's bouncing and rocking around on all the cracks and all the dips and divots in the track. I thought this was a smooth racetrack, not according to the V8 Signet. And then we get to the elephant in the room, the gearbox. Yeah, so it's the old sport shift automated manual. And when you change up, oh, there's a big delay and a bit of a slur and you nod your head forwards. And it's not fantastic if I'm honest, but look, I'm not gonna mark this car down on that too much because I'm not here to set a lap time, am I? I'm here to have fun and I guarantee you this, whoever drives this car, whether it's my grandmother or a Formula One driver is gonna get out of it with a massive smile 
slapped across their face. To the owner, whoever you are, maybe you're watching out there, big respect, big up yourself, because what you bought here is not really a car, it's medicine for the soul. <laughs> Moving on to the V600, a swan song for the last generation Vantage and a tribute to the monstrous twin supercharged 600 horsepower Vantage from the 90s, hence the old school spec. So you get a dog leg seven speed manual gearbox under there is a 5.9 liter naturally aspirated V12 producing 592 horsepower and only seven coupes and seven roasters of this were ever made, all with a hole punch bonnet a bit like Bond's DB10. It is essentially a GT12 without all the wings and with a manual gearbox fitted, a bit like the Porsche 911R was to the GT3, except the 911R didn't cost 1.2 million pounds. Yeah, here's Ollie to see if that astronomical price is actually justified. 1.2 million pounds for an old Vantage? It had better be pretty special. Okay, so what have we got here then? So far, much like an old Vantage, really. It feels quite nimble because it's a bit of a shorter wheelbase than the bigger cars we've got here. It's not an easy gearbox. It's really, really not an easy gearbox, this seven-speed manual. Once it's in one of the planes, you can row it to and fro reasonably easily, but the gate's so narrow that coming across the gate, oh, got that one right, and you don't always get it right at all. Sometimes it's a bit of a lottery. I quite like it through these tighter corners though. You can sort of tuck it in and it's just about, you've got enough space to play just about. But let's just slow down a second because I need to turn it into sport mode. I'm gonna stiffen up the dampers because I'm just getting a little bit of looseness at the top and I'm gonna slacken off the traction control. Right, off we go then. No idea which gear I'm in. Third, it says there. We'll go with that. So let's slide it into the chicane a bit. Still got a bit of roll in it. And it just sort of lurches slightly. You wonder, there you go, I've missed that one. Went third to fourth instead of third to second. It's actually quite fighting. It's not... I mean, it's a great engine. And it's quite nice on turning, but it's just a little bit, it feels its age. So it gets a stroll on down the straights, but it just feels an old fashioned car now. And not really, this seven speed gearbox takes a lot of managing. And that's the story of this car really. Seven speed gearbox as a manual doesn't really work. And the chassis feels a little bit old fashioned now. And then it goes too far. I'm not completely sold on this one, I have to say. I'd be spending my 1.2 million somewhere else. Now, the craze for chopping the roof and windscreen off your supercar and charging mega money appears to have arrived at Ferrari with the Monza, at McLaren with the Elva, at Lamborghini with the SC20, and now at Aston Martin with this the V12 Speedster, yours for £765,000. Now, say what you want about this type of car being as useful as a chocolate teapot, but that's just missing the point, isn't it? This is an A to A car. It's about that special Sunday drive. It's about maximum entertainment and minimum practicality. Under there is the 5.2 litre twin turbo V12 shared with the DB11 and the DBS. And that's all you need to know, really. You either get it or you don't. But if you ever get the opportunity to drive one of these things, make sure you grab it with both hands and both feet, because there's really nothing like it out there, apart from, you know, strapping yourself to the front of the train. So we've already done a full film with this car, the Ferrari Monza and the McLaren Elva up in Scotland, which you can watch by clicking the link somewhere above my head. But here's a little taster. Ow. Oh, Ow. Ow. 
Oh. And now for something you probably weren't expecting, an Aston Martin with just two wheels. This is called the AMB001. It's a tie up with a hundred year old bike maker, Bruff Superior. Just a couple of pieces of housekeeping here. This is a track only bike. You can't actually ride it on the road. And this particular one doesn't work. So we can't ride it today, but that's probably a good thing because my bike skills are basic at best. It costs 95, thousand pounds which is quite a lot of money when you consider you can get a Ducati Panigale V4 for under 20 grand but this thing it's about so much more than speed isn't it it's art it's a piece of sculpture that just happens to be massively potent because it's powered by a V2 turbo engine producing 180 horsepower and it weighs just 180 kilograms for that perfect one to one power to weight ratio so that's it. That's your all-star lineup from Aston Martin's glittering Q portfolio. There's just one question left to ask. Which one of these would you take home? Let us know in the comments. Me, I'll let you know when I get the Victor keys back off Ollie. Now, go on, clear off. Run the credits.